go ahead and hit that first slide for me, would you?
for those of you who have been at Crossroads for quite a few years, you'll recognize this face up here, Miss Lovely Amy. Welcome back. All right, let's go ahead and stand together and we'll begin worship this morning. Just a couple housekeeping items before we uh, do our greeting time. Don't forget to grab your communion off the side tables or in the back, as well as take a moment to fill out that connection card for us. That really helps us to serve you as best we can. That being out of the way, go ahead and try to find somebody new to say hello to. Thank you. 
Sing a little louder. 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 Sing
Father God, we just lift you up this morning. Thank you for everything that you are going to do through the sermon today, through Caleb and his message. God, would you just allow the Holy Spirit to come in and open up receptiveness in our hearts and our minds and call us to action. God, we love you. It's in your name we pray. All God's people said, amen. Go ahead and be seated. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all in. If you're here in person, if you're joining us online, we're we're glad you're here uh, as we continue our series called Let's Talk About It. Last week, we started this series diving into some big, uh, heavy, and and potentially messy topics. And, And we said, you know, these are topics that we may not want to have to deal with, but they're very much a part of our lives. And so therefore, we're going to talk about it and talk about how to approach these topics from a biblical and Christ-like point of view. Last week, we talked about the topic of trauma, heavy topic for a lot of people, a difficult topic for a lot of people. Today, we're going to dive into another one that is very, very difficult, how we as the church can engage the LGBT community. Uh, And to do that, I knew from the get-go there was one person that I wanted to have come and talk about this uh, because he's got a story that I can't tell. And he's got a way of engaging that community that I can't tell. About nine years ago, I got the chance to meet Caleb Kaltenbach. We were uh, in our uh, residency program out in, in Phoenix, Arizona. And Caleb, in 2015, released the book Messy Grace. And so he was uh, going to various churches. He lived out in Southern California, uh, still does actually. And so he came to the church we were at to uh, preach on this topic. And they gave us all a copy. And, And for the first time in my life, I actually felt really important because I got an advanced copy. It wasn't on shelves yet, and I had the whole thing read. And then I found out every single person on staff got an advanced copy, which was like 400 people. And then every other church he went to got advanced copies, and I started to feel slightly less important. But there was one particular day, the way we did church out there, we had Saturday evening services, and when somebody would preach, uh, they would preach live on Saturday night services, and then just one time on Sunday morning, and the other services, they would just do it via video. So I was sitting in our cafe area between services, or during a service actually, when it was kind of this lull, and uh, Caleb walked by. While he's on a video screen right above our heads, he sits beside me at a table, and we struck up a conversation, and a friendship started. Uh, we, we realized very quickly we had a lot of things in common, like our love for Star Wars, our love for inappropriate memes, our love for uh, things that would make us laugh that other people would just roll their eyes at. But the more I've gotten to know him, the more I've gotten to know his heart. He wrote this book a few years ago, and when I read it, it, it changed my life. A couple of years ago, he came out with another one called Messy Truth that rocked me even more. And I would encourage you to get a chance to, to read through those. But today you're going to get to hear his story. He was excited to come back here because this is home for him. He grew up here in the Kansas City area, so he jumped at the chance to come back. So would you please welcome to the stage Caleb Kaltenbach. How are we doing? Good? Am I on here? Yeah? No? Not on? I am on. No. There we go. Outstanding. We got that taken care of. How are we doing today? Good? Good. I can't tell because I asked you earlier, how are you doing? You all like, uh, okay. <laughs> we just got done like singing songs to the creator of the universe. You actually woke up this morning and you don't live in West Virginia. How are we doing today? Good? Yeah. Right, a little bit better. I expect more, but a little bit better. Hey, uh, my name is Caleb. We haven't met, and um, I love Pastor Kurt. Uh, you guys love Pastor Kurt and his family. If, um, if, like, I just want to let you know, if I were looking for a church, this is a church that I would attend because of leaders like Kurt and his family. So if you haven't gotten to know them, you should. And you guys, like, God just bless you, and I'm excited about the future of this church. Um, I, I grew up here and in Columbia, Missouri, and I also lived in Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri. Um, I now, my wife and kids and I, we live in Los Angeles because we enjoy not having money and um, <laughs> giving it to the state. There's nothing that gives me more happiness than to give my money to the state. Mm. Anyway, so 
we live out in Los Angeles. Um, I'm on staff at a sister church of this church, Shepherd Church. And um, just want to let you know, I'm a huge Chiefs fan. There are many Chiefs fans out in Los Angeles. Many, okay? Um, yeah, we, we don't like the Raiders. Or the Broncos. So there are a few people that need to be saved. Just a few. I asked my brother-in-law, who's from Southern California, he's a big Chiefs fan. I'm like, how did you become a big Chiefs fan? He's like, well, when Joe Montana came over the Chiefs, I just followed him and I just stayed. And other people said, well, when Marcus Allen came over from the Raiders, I just followed them and I stayed. So there you go, right there. And it's, it's easy to cheer for righteousness. Um, so yeah, yeah, we're, we're big Chiefs fans and, uh, glad to be here with you. Um, I, besides being on staff at Shepherd Church, I also travel a lot for what I do and I, uh, go, uh, to different, uh, churches and Bible colleges and seminaries and, um, I, I help in, in ministries and I help, uh, churches figure out things relating to LGBTQ and faith, you know, how to hold on to their, to their doctrine, to what they believe, and at the same time, you know, create margin for everyone to be able to attend and hear the gospel. So I fly a lot, and I, I hate flying. And it's not because I'm afraid to die. I figure it's a good way to go um, if you're going to go out that way. You know, it really is. Some of you are like, sounds terrifying. No, you're going to pass out before you hit the ground, Okay. You're 30,000 feet, you go plummeting down, you're out like a light before you hit the ocean or the land, wherever you are. It's a good way, okay? It's memorable. But <laughs> the reason why I don't like flying is because people are gross, just in general, human beings. We have a generation of people that will walk barefoot into a commercial airliner bathroom. Yeah, and they're probably amputees by now. But um, I, if you look at my social media, especially Instagram, I, I have reels, like two or three dedicated to all the weird things that people do in airplanes and airports. I take pictures of them without them knowing it. Some might call it stalking. It's an ugly word. I call it stealthing. And so anyway, there's this one time I was on this flight about three or four years ago. And I sit in the aisle seat because statistically you have a better chance of surviving a crash than if you sit in the window. You're toast if you sit in the window. So you window people, good luck. I sit in the aisle seat. There's some lady sitting next to me. I don't know who she is, okay? We get to cruising altitude. Homegirl takes off her shoes and socks and starts clipping her toenails right next to me. I usually don't say anything. This time I did. I just looked at her and I said, seriously? She said, oh, is this bothering you? And I said, well, I mean, it was like a wood chipper, people. It was like, Pfft. And I said, yes, your toenail is on my shoe. I said, it wasn't there like a minute ago. She's like, well, I guess I could do this later. And I said, I love that plan. Let's go with that plan. As a matter of fact, that's when I cut my toenails at home by myself. I said, I've been married for years. My wife has never seen me cut my toenails. And she's like, I don't usually cut them at home. I'm like, this is when I've lost all hope for humanity. If you ever go to trial, that's who's going to be on the jury, by the way, right there, this lady, people like this. That's who's running our country just in general. And I just think to myself, we need Jesus, right? Because I don't know if you agree with me or not, <clears throat> but people are messy. I really do. I think people are messy, everybody. And I'm going to make a statement here, and it's about all of us. So if you feel offended, um, you know, I'm, I'm good with that. I'm offending myself too. And it's not even what I'm saying. It's what Paul says. Like, I truly believe that everybody I meet is insane, is crazy. I've never met a non-crazy person. Seriously, everybody. Even though you're like, oh, no, this person's like, no, they're insane. Every single person. And some of you are like, Caleb, I don't agree with that. Well, then skip Romans chapter three on your Bible reading plan. Don't read Romans three, what Paul says. Because Paul says it worse. He says, everybody's evil. No one is good. 
Everybody's done malice. Everybody has slander on their lips. I think mine, a little bit more win friends, influence people style. But Paul says it more harshly. People are insane. Let's just be honest. You're a messy person. First two letters of the word messy, M-E, me, messy, right? I'm messy, you're messy. But here's the deal. Okay, let's be on this. Like, you are okay with people who are messy in the same ways that you're messy. You're like, yeah, I love messy people. What about the people who are messy in different ways than you are? You're like, those people got issues. Right? And some of you aren't wanting to own that. And I get it. I get it. You're a human being, just like me. You don't want to admit it. I get it. You can admit it in your head. But here's the deal. If you're going to love Jesus, if I'm going to love Jesus, we got to love people who are not like us. We have to. Because here's the deal. If you follow Jesus, that means your main identity is in Christ. Okay, he's your main identity. He is the main defining aspect of who you are. Nothing else. Now, there are other components of your life. And there are other parts of your story. But God never designed you to be defined by anything other than him. And elements and aspects and chapters in your stories are never the main identifier of who you are as a person. Only Jesus. You see, this is why, this is why, I don't like it when people put adjectives in front of the word Christian. I don't. I don't like it when people say, well, he's a conservative Christian. Well, he's, he's a liberal Christian. You know, they're a progressive Christian. They're a Methodist Christian. They're a Presbyterian. I don't like that. You know, because we shouldn't modify our relationship with Jesus. He modifies us. Not the other way around. It's just Christian, period, Christian. Nothing before. Nothing after. Christian, period. That's what we are. That's your main identity. But a big part of your identity is your community, who you spend time with, who you're around. And and hear hear me out on this, okay? To live out your identity well, you got to love God and love people, right? That's what Jesus said in Matthew 22, 36 through 40, right? Paul said it in a different way in Romans 13, 8 through 10 and Galatians 5, 14, when he says, loving your neighbor fulfills the law. So if you're going to do that well, and that's an outpouring of your identity in Christ, man, how do you get along with people that are not like you? How do you get along with people that you don't like? How do you, how do you get along with people that don't like you? Now, I can't imagine anybody not liking you good people. It's the people in the other two services, right? Them. <laughs> They've got issues, not you. They have issues. But like, seriously, how do you like or even love people that voted for the other candidate? Right? This is an election year, right? Here in America, aka hell on earth, right? (laughs) How do you like those people? How do you like the people that work in organizations that you would never work in? How do you like or love or be empathetic towards people who are in relationships that you would never be in, hold views on scripture that you would never have, have a different morality than you have? How do you do that? Because that's really how you live out your identity in Christ. And so to understand that, we're going to turn uh, to a certain chapter in the Bible. And in just a moment, after I set the scene, we're going to have the words on the screen. But if you want to get ready, um, if you want to open up your mobile devices or your Bibles, like I said, we'll have the words on the screen in just a moment. We're going to be in John chapter 8. And in John chapter 8, Jesus is in the temple. Now, last year, I was in Israel, God willing, going back next year. Went to Israel last year before everything fell apart over there. And when I was there... One of the most touching, memorable moments was being at the Western Wall, at the Wailing Wall, because that was one of the walls of Solomon's temple. And, and I, I just went up there, and I, I can't understand. I just started crying because you're literally there with something that Jesus saw in that moment. And on the other side of that wall would have been the temple courts. That would have been where uh, Jesus was hanging out, like the church lobby in our passage And he's hanging out there and he's teaching people in the church lobby, in the temple courts. And the Pharisees, they try to trap him. And I'll get to that in a minute. But we're going to read John chapter 8, verses 2 through the middle of verse 6. Take a look at this. At dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher... This woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? 
the, the beginning of verse six, we're going to stop in the middle, but this just drives me nuts. Look at this. They're using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. Now you have the Pharisees. They're like the celebrity pastors of the day. There were some 6,000 Pharisees back in Jesus's day. And then you have the teachers of the law. They're like the Bible college and seminary professors, okay? And they translate and they write down copies of the Torah, of the Old Testament. And they both, both groups have the entire Old Testament memorized word for word. They have commentaries on the Old Testament memorized and they have teachings from rabbis memorized, okay? And they were supposed to be the religious leaders of the day. The Pharisaical movement started out good. It started out to protect the word of God, but quickly became legalistic, very much so. And, and, and these groups, they hated Jesus, okay, for one reason. You see, Jesus came full of grace and truth, of compassion and conviction, of principle and mercy. And yet the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they controlled people with fear. See, if you ever want to win an election nowadays, on either side of the aisle, here's what you do. You get people to be afraid. Because when people are afraid, they are easy to control. But when people have courage and they stand up in the face of fear, you can't control those people. And you end up scaring the people that are trying to control you. And so they control people through fear. When Jesus shows up, people were leaving their sect and following Jesus. And they're like, we gotta do something to try to get Jesus. So they're always trying to trap him. So here's what they do. We read in the text, they find this woman caught in the act of adultery. Did you hear what I said? They caught her in the, in the, in the act. You're like, how do they do that? And I'm like, I don't know. They're creepers, right? And they take her and they drag her through town. They embarrass her. They throw her at the feet of Jesus. And she's standing there. And she says, teacher, or they say, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. They say, in Deuteronomy 22, it does say, if a man or woman is caught in the act of adultery, you know, take, you know, ha have a trial. If they're found guilty, take them outside the city gates and stone them. And that's a different time, different place and everything. But did you hear what I said? A man and a woman. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, where's the dude? <laughs> He's still not there. And I guess what makes me mad is they don't even care about God's word. This is not about God's word. This is about power. This is about their power that they don't want to lose. And even says that in the gospels, they're afraid of losing their seats to Jesus. They don't care about this woman. They don't care about her redemption. They don't care about her story. They don't care about what she's been through. They don't care about what happened to her. They are using this woman as much as the man who was having an affair with her was using her. Now, I don't know what you think about life and everything, but hopefully you'll agree that's messed up. Like that, that's bad. But Jesus does something awkward here. Okay? Now, don't get offended when I say Jesus does something awkward. I didn't say he does something creepy. I just said he has an awkward response. Look at, look at, verse, look at the end of verse 6. <clears throat> but Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. That's an awkward response. Okay? And if you do not think so, that's probably because you've read this passage many, many times. Some of you have been Christians since God was a boy, okay? So you've read this passage a lot. Let me illustrate it this way, maybe you'll understand. When was the last time you were in an argument with somebody and you said, hold on, and you started writing on the ground, okay? My wife and I got in a spat last week or a couple weeks ago, I can't remember what we were fighting about, but I tried this and I don't recommend it. <laughs> we were arguing about something. I bent down in the kitchen and started writing on the ground. She's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm acting like Jesus. I figured one of us should. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I did not say that. My wife is a fiery Latina. You know how you know I didn't say that? Because I wouldn't be here. I'd be on Unsolved Mysteries. <laughs> Kurt would be like, we were supposed to have a guest speaker. I don't know where he went. And, and so, like, a lot of people try to figure out what in the world was Jesus writing? Was he writing verses of scripture? Was he writing down the sins of the people? And I found this really interesting verse all the way back in the Old Testament. 
<laughs> in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 17, 13, that might give us kind of an example or an idea of what Jesus was writing. See if you can make the connection. Lord, you're the hope of Israel. All who forsake you will be put to shame, and those who turn from you will be written in the dust. Or in the original Hebrew, that word dust in English can also mean dirt, mud, ground, sand. Why? Because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. Now, if we were in Vegas, here's what I would bet. That Jesus was writing down the names of the Pharisees in the ground in that moment. He was literally living out Jeremiah 17, 13. Because they had forsaken the Lord. Because they had all this knowledge, but they had no love. Hear me out on this. God doesn't care how much you know if you don't have any love and compassion to show. God could give a rip of how much you know about scripture. He doesn't care if you don't have love. And that's not me saying it. If you don't like that, you gotta take it up with a Jewish guy named Paul who wrote a good portion, who said that when you have all this knowledge, knowledge puffs up, love builds up. When you have all this knowledge without love, it's like a clanging symbol in the ear of God. And, and we have a lot of that going on everywhere. Back then we did, we still do today because that's a big human problem. It's not just a Christian problem, it's a human problem. But they don't get it. They don't get what Jesus is saying because when somebody holds up the mirror to us, do we ever really get it? <laughs> Look at verse seven. Going back to John 8, verse 7. When they kept on questioning Jesus, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down, he wrote on the ground. You see, they believed back then what the leadership of this church believes, what I believe, hopefully what you believe, you follow Jesus, that God is the only sinless being in existence. That everybody else has sin, okay? And so there are two reasons why Jesus knew after he challenged them that they wouldn't throw a stone. He said, any one of you without sin, be the first to throw a stone at her. If they picked up a stone and threw it, that claiming to be without sin, they would be lying. And everybody around them knew that. And everybody knew that they had sin because they were a human being. I don't know if you know, but out of the 613 commands in the Old Testament that make the law, God put lying in the top 10. You remember the top 10 when Moses went up to Sinai, looked like Charlton Heston, brought down two tablets, got mad, broke them. You remember that, right? And so right there, lying, man, at best, lying severely damages the relationship. At worst, it severs it, right? Because lying is a betrayal. But then they also knew that, that, you know, they shouldn't throw a stone because if God is the only sinless being in existence and they claim to be without sin and they threw it, they're claiming to be without sin like God. They're claiming to be God. That's blasphemy. And the very rock that they threw would be used to kill them because blasphemy, automatic death penalty. Like, who has who in checkmate? I tell people all the time, you may not believe in Jesus, but you gotta admit, he's got mad skills. Like, you don't wanna get in an argument with him. And I actually think verse nine is comical. Look at this, this is great. This is how it ends right here. It says, at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Verse 10 says, Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. And, and this last part of verse 11, this is the whole reason why I took you through this passage. This is the principle of how you and I live out our identity in Christ by loving people. This is how we love people who are not like us, that we don't like, that... that think differently, that vote differently, that are in relationships that we, need, we would never be in, that are in relationships that we don't understand. This is how we do it. It's one long sentence in the original language. It says, neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Okay? Neither do I condemn you. Grace, leave your life of sin in truth. And so here, here's what I want you to know. John 1, 14, 17 say that Jesus came full of both grace and truth at the same time. But here's the problem, okay? Most of us in here, we either land more on the side of grace or more on the side of truth. You're like, you're categorizing me, Caleb. Yep, and I'm gonna do it again, okay? You're either more on the side of grace or more on the side of truth. And you know these people. 
You're sitting next to some of these people. Don't look at them, by the way. You know the grace people. We love them, but they're annoying, right? These are the people who are like, God is love and God loves you and they send texts and God is love and you're in a Bible study. They're like, well, do we have to read Romans 1? You know, the wrath of God. You know, that, that's, you know, let's focus on the love of God. You know, and I get it. I, I love you people, but you know, good night. Put your big boy, big girl pants on and read Romans 1. I get it. But then you have the truth people and you are annoying. You're not helpful. You think you're helpful when you correct people. You know these people. Again, don't look to the person next to you. All eyes up here. These are the people, you're in a Bible study or Sunday school or small group. You're like, well, remember when Paul said in Colossians, blah, 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 and they're like, that's Philippians. Well, thank you. Wow. That made everything better. You know, Elijah, when he did, that was Elisha. You're like, wow, I'm glad you're here to correct me. Thank you. I love that. Love to be corrected, right? And these people are annoying. But man, they're annoying. Here's the deal. If you take sides and you're either on the grace side, you're like holding a rubber band by one side. Would you ever do this? Hold this rubber band by one side? No, it's annoying. There's no power. It's flimsy. That's what it's like when you're all about the grace but no truth. When you hold it on the other side and you're all about the truth but no grace, you have a lot of knowledge, but you're flimsy, you're weak, you're annoying. You have no power. You just have a big cement head. That's it. (laughs) So where does the power lie? Well, check this out. If you stand for both grace and truth, where does the power lie? The power lies in the tension of the two. That's where the power is, okay? You see, I believe, oh, that's already up there, okay? Love is the tension of grace and truth. That's what I want you to know. Love is the tension of both grace and truth. And you feel this tension when you're like, okay, the Bible says this, but God, you know, you know but my friend is doing this, And Jesus said this, but my family member is going to do this. And my family member is in this relationship, but Paul said this. And my friend is going to do this over here. And you feel the struggle even within yourself. And you feel this tension between what the Bible says and what the people you love are doing. And we try to resolve the tension on ourselves by taking sides and resolving the tension. We think that'll make everything better because then we won't feel tension. And you become weak and annoying when that happens. You know what, where the real strength is? Like, it doesn't mean you're not a Christian. You're a Christian, but don't call yourself a mature Christian if you take sides between grace and truth, because that's on Christ's like. Jesus stood for both grace and truth. You don't get the right to take sides. Who are you? Nobody gave you a referee's whistle. You know how much faith it takes to stretch over to the grace side if you're all about the truth and the truth side if you're all about the grace? A lot. And if you are a Christian, you got to learn to be comfortable with uncomfortableness. You got to learn to live in the tension of grace and truth because this is where Jesus lived. You got to learn my favorite theological answer. You ready? I don't know. You live in the tension of grace and truth. And by the way, if you don't like what I'm saying about tension, like Christianity might not be the right place for you. (laughs) We have tension all throughout our faith. Some of you are like, no, we don't. Let's do Caleb's rubber band test, okay? We believe in one God but the Trinity. Hello. You ever try to explain the Trinity to someone? That's fun. So you believe in three gods? No, we believe in one God. But you believe in three. No, one God revealed in three persons. But you believe in three gods? No, one. One God, three persons. What? Don't try to figure out theological math. And then the illustrations, you know, God's like ice, water, and steam. No, he's not, okay? God's like a pizza divided into three parts. He's not Italian. (laughs) So there's tension there. What about the fact that God inspired the Bible, but it was written by sinful people? What about the fact that Jesus is fully God and fully human? What about the fact that death and evil were defeated at the cross and the resurrection, not yet destroyed? 
God is sovereign and in control, but allows us to have free will. The virgin birth. Okay? Jesus died, but resurrected a new body. You can be a good preacher and still have hair. Come on. (laughs) There's tension all throughout your faith. You already live in tension. You may not even know it. So why do we try to resolve the tension of grace and truth? Why do we run from it? I'll tell you why. Grace and truth always has to do with emotional attachments. And emotional attachments hurt like nothing else, right? I bet you've stayed up all night worrying about somebody you love who was hurting or maybe somebody who died. I bet you've hopefully never stayed up all night saying, how in the world is Jesus fully God and fully human? How are we going to put this together? I don't know. I got to call Pastor Kirk. I don't know. He loves to get phone calls at two in the morning, by the way. You should call him and ask him (laughs) at two in the morning. How do these two go together, Kirk? He loves He loves that. Seriously. You want a cell phone number? I'll give it to you afterwards. Okay, but you have to, if you want to be like Jesus, you got to learn to live in the tension of grace and truth. Let me me illustrate what this means. So I don't know who it is that you need to live in the tension of grace and truth with. With me, it's my mom and my dad. You see, (laughs) when I was two years old, my parents were both professors in Columbia, Missouri, and they got divorced, and both of them went into same-sex relationships. My dad was more in the closet until I was older, but my mom moved to Kansas City, and with her partner, Vera, who is a psychologist, they became activists. They were on the local board of directors for GLAD. When I was growing up, they took me with them to parties and clubs and bars and campouts and uh, pride parades. And I remember one pride parade I was marching in uh, with my mom and her partner. I must have been like 10 to 12 or something like that. At the end of it, there were all these uh, Christians on the street corners, holding up signs saying, God hates you, no room for you, turn or burn. Some of you already probably know who these people are, uh, but I, I don't respect them enough to even say their name, but they call themselves Christian, even though that's questionable. And when people from my mom's parade would go try to talk to them, they would get sprayed with water and urine saying, this is what Jesus thinks of you. I remember looking at my mom, I said, mom, why are they acting like that? And no joke, here's what my mom said. Caleb, they're Christians. Christians hate gay people. If you're not like them, they will not like you. And I saw it proved time and time again. I remember seeing young men die of AIDS in the 1980s during the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. And I remember going to rooms with my mom saying goodbye to young men who were dying of AIDS. And I don't know if you've ever seen somebody die from AIDS. It is a horrible, horrible, awful death. And there were some young guys, their families wouldn't even come and see them because their family was taking a moral stand. Well, there's a difference between taking a moral stand and being a moron, of which they were being. And then there were other families that we saw, they were there, but they would never talk to anybody. They would never, you know, comfort or touch their son or anything like that. And I would ask my mom, why are they acting like that? She said, Caleb, I told you time and time again, those are Christians. And Christians hate gay people. And they will never like you unless you are like them. And I was like, I never want to be a Christian because here's my rationale. If Christians are this bad, I can't imagine how awful Jesus is. I think we really underestimate how much our words and actions will either encourage people to follow Jesus or discourage people from following him. And so by the time I got to be 16, I was living it up, partying, Sneaking out at night, my parents didn't care. My hair was down to here. Since then, the Lord removeth and addeth. (laughs) Didn't know that was funny. Thank you. Yeah, this is a roast apparently, but yes. And and so I, I, um, when I was 16 and in high school, I got invited by another high schooler at my school to go to a Bible study that he led for high schoolers. And I thought, this is perfect. I'm going to go and I'm going to learn about the Bible and I'm going to disprove their faith. And that was a plan that worked out real well, as you can tell. It was a great plan. And so I remember I I showed up, and at the age of 16, I had never stepped foot in a Christian household, not even a Catholic household. Now, with what I'm getting ready to say, if this describes your house, that's great. There's nothing wrong with your house looking like this. You do you, boo, 
okay? Nothing wrong with that. As long as you don't have posters of the band Nickelback on your wall, I think you're good. Seriously, because there is such a thing called class, people. But I walked into this house. It looked like they had raided a Bible bookstore. It looked like a Bible. Anybody in here ever been to a Bible bookstore at any portion of your life? Okay. You walk in there and they had Christian breath mints by the front door. Do you guys know we have our own breath mints? Did you know that? <laughs> They're called testaments. <laughs> I know it's still early, right? But you don't get it. Google it afterwards. But I would never recommend trying them unless you want to see what peppermint and cyanide taste like together because it's awful. Like my breath was bad before and I wish that I had never had one. Thankfully, Jesus is not like that. And then they had the Bible bookstore framed pictures on the wall. Have you seen those? Like they had framed pictures of sheep and lions on the wall. And I'm like, who are these weirdos? I've never seen somebody frame a picture of an animal they don't own and put it up on the wall. Never. I'm like, are these the animals they've sacrificed here in the Bible study? Then my friend comes up from the basement and says, ah, we've circled up downstairs. Won't you join us? And I'm like, well, this is the beginning of a horror movie. I mean, I know that's one of the rules. You never go down the basement. Like I've, I've seen Unsolved Mysteries. I know. So I went down there and everybody's reading from 1 Corinthians. And I can't find it because I didn't know God put a table of contents in here, right? So... I go to First Chronicles thinking, how different could it be? I read a verse about some dude getting impaled. They're like, where are you? And I'm like, well, I'm in First Chronicles. They're like, oh, you're in the Old Testament. I'm like, is there a new one? Like, we have updated 2.0? Like, I, I didn't know that. I thought the Bible was a boring, old, dusty book written by a bunch of dead Middle Eastern people a long time ago. But the more that I read, the more that I felt like God was disproving my life instead of me disproving him. And I started studying what the Bible had to say about sexuality, marriage, relationships, because I knew this was going to be a big deal, right? Right? Yeah, it's gonna be, it still is, but really my household, uh, yeah. So here's what I came to the conclusion of back then, I still believe it today. That God designed sex to be expressed in a marriage between one male and one female, and any expression of sex outside of that falls short of that. It's a sin. But here's what I also believe. That a theological conviction is never a catalyst to devalue another human being. That what I believe about sex and marriage does not determine my love for my neighbor. Because I can love someone and disagree with them. Because I'm called to love. And if my view of marriage and sex and intimacy impacts the worth or dignity I think this person has, I'm not following Jesus. I'm following Caiaphas. I'm following the Pharisees. And so at the age of 16, I called up one summer, I called up that summer, I called up my friend Greg. I'd been going to his dad's church in Columbia, Missouri on Sunday nights to the youth group. And I called Greg. His dad was a preacher. And I said, Greg, I think I've turned Christian. get it off me. What do I do? He said, well, let's go eat Chinese food and I'll baptize you. Yeah, that was an Acts 2. Why not? So we did that. And I got baptized. And then I was at a Christ in UCIY conference, gave my life to the ministry. And then I had this un un unfortunate just difficulty, okay? I was so nervous because at the age of 16, I had to come out to my three activist gay parents as a Christian who had changed his view on sexuality and now wanted to be a pastor. And they kicked me out of the house. Don't feel bad for laughing, by the way. It, it is funny, but they kicked me out of the house. And like, I stayed with friends at the church I'd been attending until my parents let me back in. And that was difficult, but here's the thing. I work with a lot of LGBTQ plus students and college students right now. High school students, middle school students, college students are like, you have no idea what it's like to be rejected by your family. You have no idea what it's like, this or that. And I said, actually, I do. I know exactly what it's like to be kicked out, to be rejected because of your perception of who you are. And I'll tell you this. 
Whatever pain and oppression you've ever felt does not give you the right to return it on anyone else because then in a sick and twisted way, you are imitating the people that hurt you instead of imitating Jesus. And you're becoming more like the people that hurt you than Jesus. Bitterness turns you into the people you fear the most. You see, it was during this time that I learned a big principle of how to live out the tension of grace and truth, and it's this. First way, never allow fear to determine the value of people. Never allow fear from some people to determine the value of many people. You hear me on that? Okay? The Pharisees were fearful of this woman because she contrasted with everything they taught. And because they were the religious leaders, everybody else was fearful of, them, of her. What she did, adultery, obviously wrong. But that did not give them the right to push her down and punch down on her. And same thing happens today. I, I, I love, one of my favorite authors is Agatha Christie, the mystery novelist, you know? I love Agatha Christie. Nothing like a, a British woman to write a murder mystery. And, I, and I'll tell you this. She has one of the best definitions of fear that I've ever read. She says, fear is incomplete knowledge. Think about that real quick. Fear is incomplete knowledge. We naturally fear what we don't understand or what makes us feel threatened. Okay? And, and so what we, what we usually do is fight or flight. What we need to do is lean into our relationship with God who has all knowledge and has all power and that gives us the ability to engage what we don't understand. How do you put this in practical terms? Can I just make a suggestion? This is gonna step on some toes. Just get ready, okay? Some of you are not gonna like this. Some of y'all need to turn off Fox News and CNN and NBC and News Nation you will be happier and less annoying. <laughs> Let me say something else. Here's what I mean. I sh I'm not saying that you shouldn't be informed. I am saying this. If you watch the news or listen to the news or listen to talking heads and outrage porn on YouTube called news, if you engage that more than you are praying or reading, that's called idolatry. That is a big issue if you're watching more of the news than you are reading scripture or praying or engaging in the spiritual disciplines. Listen, I get it. I used to watch the news all the time and I get angry. I stopped watching the news. It was great. I wasn't angry anymore. Everybody said we had a hurricane coming to Southern California. I said, there's a rainstorm. There were people who said, no, it's going to be a hurricane just like Florida. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. You know what it was? A lot of rain. You know how I knew? Somehow, I wasn't watching the news. People texted me. Hurricane's coming. I said, really? I don't believe it. And it was a big rainstorm. I'm not as angry anymore because I don't watch the news as much. I do watch more Unsolved Mysteries, and I'm scared all the time, though, but that's different. <laughs> Need to listen to less true crime podcasts, but still, walk out at night, I'm like, it's over there, you know? Like, I'm afraid somebody would kidnap me and it wouldn't get much. My wife would be like, keep them. Anyway, <laughs> never allow fear from some people to determine the value of many people. And, and so, I, my parents let me move back in. I eventually went to Bible college down at Ozark Christian College. And I preached at this one church for 18 months. And um, we were the largest church per capita in the world at that time. 50 people in the town, this town of Missouri. 50 people, 25 of them went to our church. Half our town was one for Christ. Largest church per capita in the world <laughs> at that time, okay? Went there, preached there for 18 months. One Sunday, I got my mom to come to church with me. I was excited, she came. And she didn't come the next Sunday. I guess she didn't like the sermon. And so I showed up by myself. And that Sunday, there were two elders waiting for me on the doorstep. And they said, Caleb, we want to talk to you. If you're going to keep preaching here, don't you ever bring somebody like your mother again. We don't like those people. And I said, oh, well, I, I don't like you. Funny coincidence. I said, I quit right now. They're like, you can't quit. 
we need a sermon today. I said, oh, you don't want that. <laughs> Not after this conversation, trust me. You don't, you don't want to, we got to have a sermon. I'm like, <laughs> you asked for it. And so I, I had written a sermon on fasting, ripped it up. You know, who cares about fasting? And... <laughs> In the 80s and 90s, there's a musician that was popular. He still is around. You may have heard of him, Bon Jovi. He had this song called Blaze of Glory that if you're going to go out, <laughs> going to go out in a blaze of glory, which I did. Went up there and freestyled a sermon on grace and truth and compassion and conviction and principle and mercy and walked out of there and I said, God, if I'm ever in a church, I want to be in a church filled with messy, broken people, people who are cutting, people who have emotional problems, people who have mental problems, people who have been in gangs and homeless, people who have all the money in the world and they think they're perfect, but they're weirdos and people who have no money and they're weirdos and people who have been married umpteen times and people who have never been married and are depressed about that, people who are happy about not being married, people who like watching Real Housewives of whatever, God have mercy on them. That's the kind of church I want to be in because that is the church, okay? The church is a mosaic of messy, broken lives that God has united together to glorify himself. I do not believe for one moment that Jesus Christ came to die on the cross for a place masquerading as a church when it's really a Pharisee factory where you have to agree with us to be with us. We have to look like us to be with us. Blech. No. And this led me to the next way that we live out this tension of grace and truth. And it's this, follow Jesus more than traditions and trends. Follow Jesus more than traditions or trends. Now, traditions are important, but they're man-made. Trends, they're important. They tell a story, but they come and go. They ebb and flow with society. That's why we call them trends, right? If they were always consistent, they wouldn't be called trends. They'd be called something else. And too many Christians base what they believe just off of traditions and trends more than Jesus. Follow Jesus more. Read this word more than the traditions you've been taught, than the trends that are going on right now. Because everything changes. God never changes. God is always the same. And I knew that I could trust him. So I graduated from Bible college. I moved out to Southern California that when it was popular to do that. And... Um, got married to my wife. As I said, she is a muy caliente Latina and she goes to the gym. She's a kinesiology major. She goes to the gym like five times a week. She has apps. She does. She's hot. I think you can tell I enjoy streaming services and Netflix. Um, <laughs> you know? And it's the animal magnetism that has drawn us together. Like I tell her, I'm like, D in your wildest imagination, did you ever ever imagine this would be your eye candy <laughs> right here for the rest of your life. You'd be married to somebody looks like a cross between Charlie Brown, Uncle Fester, Dr. Evil, and Gru. <laughs> that was my Halloween costume last year, Charlie Brown. The year before that, Dr. Evil. This year, Uncle Fester. I own my look. Somebody the other day is like, you kind of look like Ryan Gosling. I'm like, you're a crack smoker. We had two kids. We, had, we, did, we still do. <laughs> Some days, I'm like, what if we didn't have any, but we still have them. We have a 15-year-old daughter, 17-year-old son. My son is six foot three. I asked my wife if we need to do a DNA swab. I'm like, I'm not mad. I get it. I just want to know who's paying for college. <laughs> Purely transactional, okay? Well, we moved on. That's all I want to know, but my wife is taller than me. I'm her short king, and her dad was tall, so there you go. But, like, we were out there and for 11 years at the church I'm on staff at now, moved to Dallas, Texas, where I was senior pastor at a church out there, worked on a doctorate. My mom's partner died, and then in 2011, my mom and dad separately one another moved down to Dallas, Texas to be closer to our family. And then they both said, hey, can we come to your church and I said, well, sure, but you know what I and my church believes about? <laughs> and they're like, yeah. And I'm like, well, come on over. And people treat them well. 
They treated them better than I did. Do you know how annoying it is when people treat your parents better than you do? I'm like, treat them well, not that well. Shun them a little, just a little. I'm just kidding. But they treated them so well. Then in the summer of 2013, before we moved back to Southern California, at the ages of 69, 70, my mom and dad both gave their lives to Jesus Christ. Both of them. And I asked them, how did this happen? Here's what they said. People treat us like people, not like projects. Okay? Last principle. That led me to the last principle of living out this tension of grace and truth. Go to the two slides over. Next one. Here we go. Accept everyone, but don't agree with just anyone. You are called to love people. Accept people where they're at in life. Love them where they're at, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done. Okay, no matter what they believe, you love them. But that does not mean that you agree with everything they believe or their political opinions or their theological opinions or their relational decisions. And does that, that does not mean you reject them. Okay, acceptance is empathy. It is feeling with another person. You can't walk a mile in somebody's shoes. You can walk miles next to people. It is not agreeing with them. It is not rejecting them. It is walking alongside them. That's what that means. You are commanded to do that. Because I'm pretty, I don't know. You can check me, but I'm pretty sure the disciples weren't Christians when they started following Jesus. Mm. You're Jewish. And so in the same way, we need to love people because love is the tension of grace and truth. And we need to learn to live in this tension because when we do, we'll be able to love messy people that are like you and that are not like you. Let me pray for you. Lord, thank you so much for today. I pray, Father, that as we go throughout our day, as we get ready for communion, Father, and uh, get ready to go throughout our week, that we would live in the tension of grace and truth. And for anybody that has been hurt by Christians or anything else, and some Christians have caused them to have a negative view of you, Father, help them realize that, that those Christians, they do not speak for your character or the way you love people, Father. And yet, you still call us to holiness and you call us to something greater than ourselves. Help us to understand that. Help us to start taking our next step towards Jesus and help us to love people who are not like us. It's in your son's name I pray, amen. As we come into a time of communion, after seeing that visual, the tension of grace and truth, and thinking about why we take a moment in our service each week to think back of what Jesus did. As we take communion, there's a little piece of bread, a little cup of juice that symbolize the body and the blood of Jesus. It was broken, it was wounded, that was spilled. We celebrated this just a few weeks ago with Easter. I'm always drawn to Romans chapter three when the apostle Paul says these words. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have sinned, past tense. We fall short, present tense. We've sinned, we continue sinning. He says, and all are freely justified by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith as we take communion, as we look at what Jesus did, he demonstrated grace and truth. He demonstrated grace by going to the cross in my place, in your place. He demonstrated truth by saying, take up your cross and follow me. Become like me, he said. As we take communion, we look back at what he did for us not just forgiving our sins, but reconciling us to the God who created us. But also, we look forward to the promise of his return, to the promise of becoming more like him. As we take communion today, I wanna to encourage you, find that tension, of grace and truth. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for Jesus. 
We're thankful for his blood that was shed on the cross. We're thankful for the example that he gave for us on how we can try to become more like him, knowing God that requires growth, that requires pain and difficulty. But that's what we strive for is to become like him. We pray this today in Jesus' name. We would like to uh, thank you for joining us uh, this morning as we uh, touch on a very difficult topic. Uh, but I wanted to let you know of a few things we've got going on uh, before we head out of here today. Uh, starting with something that's coming up this evening for all of you high schoolers. And I don't know if there's many high schoolers or middle schoolers here in the room, but maybe you're parents of a high schooler or middle schooler. Uh, tonight we have what we are uh, really having a hard time not saying our Coke party because that really flashes back to some movies from the 80s that uh, probably shouldn't be watching anymore, but uh, a Coca-Cola party, as Stefan was very clear in stating. Uh, 6, 30, or 6 o'clock to 7.30 up in the loft. Uh, I don't really know what all's going on. You can use your imagination. Um, if you want to show up with Dr. Pepper, I would encourage you to do so. But a Coca-Cola party uh, upstairs for the youth this evening, uh, so, so make plans to be at that. We've also got coming up here in a couple of weeks uh, a really cool opportunity. We're calling it our spring clean. This is a day of service. Our missions team is putting this on. It's an opportunity for us to get out into our community and serve a few people who have some projects that can't be taken care of themselves. We're going to be doing some yard work, some cleanup, uh, some maybe exterior work on, on homes. You don't have to be highly skilled for this, but you can check out our website to sign up for that. I would really encourage you to do this because this is our opportunity to get out and be the hands and feet of Jesus in our community. Also coming up here in a few weeks on May 1st is our next May prime time, or our next prime time uh, for the month of May, and we're gonna be having a special night. Uh, it's an ordination service for Ben Sander. As you know, we're finally about to get rid of Ben and Kelly around here, and uh, we're, we're helping to send them as they go to plant a church in South Dakota. So we're going to uh, ordain him uh, in, with, with the church so that uh, as, as he goes to do that, He's got the credentials that, that are, are needed or necessary, and it's kind of our way as a church of, of showing our support for them as they go uh, to, to plant this church this coming summer. Would you all stand, and, and we'll pray as we close things out uh, this morning. Father, we are so grateful, Lord, that you show us grace. We are so grateful, Lord, too, that you show us truth so that we can strive to become more like you. God, I pray this week as we go, we would live in that tension of grace and truth with those around us. Those difficult circumstances we face, God, we would face them like Jesus would. God, I pray that we would be your light everywhere that we go. We would be your hands and feet everywhere that we go. We pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys have a great week.